Today's scripture is from the reading of the Gospel of Matthew. For it is as if for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to him. To one he gave 5 talents, to another 2, to another 1, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. At once the one who had received the 5 talents went off and traded with them and made 5 more talents. In the same way the one who had 2 talents made 2 more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled the accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Elizabeth and Zenobia. So there is a lot to unpack in this parable. Uh, This parable is famously known as the parable of the talents, Uh, and it's usually interpreted to mean something like this, uh, that we are to be good managers of the blessings that we've been given, uh, that we've all been given certain talents in life, and that how we use them matters, and it matters to God. And I think that's true. Uh, But I think there is a danger in reading this parable through that lens alone. Uh, And let me tell you what I think the danger is. Uh, The danger is that we make our place with God dependent upon our works, upon our failures and our successes. Uh, Did we do life right? Did we manage our talents the right way? If so, we will be welcomed into the master's joy, and if not, we will find ourselves in outer darkness. So let me ask you, uh, is that the gospel as you understand it? What do you all think? Uh, is our salvation dependent on our works and what we do? Come on, good Protestant people. Is that the gospel? So the gospel I learned is this, that in Jesus Christ… God has done something for me that I cannot do for myself. Uh, The gospel that I learned is well expressed by Paul in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not by your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So that's the gospel, right? That's the way I understand it. You all with me? Okay, so uh, again, if that's true, then do you see where it's dangerous to read this parable simply through the lens of kind of this servant's performance? There has to be something else going on here if it's a Jesus story. And so what I want to invite us to do this morning is to probe a little more deeply, dig a little deeper, and see what else this parable might reveal to us about God, about faith, about salvation, and about truly living a full life. So you all ready to dig, dig in a little bit? Okay. So let's make sure we've got the story straight. It's really a pretty simple story. Uh, we have three servants, and their master leaves to go on a trip, and the master leaves each of the servants with a different amount of money, we're told, according to their abilities. 
Uh, but when the master returns, two of the servants have taken what the master left them, and they've doubled it, right? They invested it in some way, and they doubled it, while the third servant takes what the master gave him and literally buries it in the ground. Uh, and when the master comes back, he says, here, here's what you gave me back. It's just, just like it was. He didn't lose anything, right? I mean, here, here it is back. The master commends the first two servants and condemns the third. So I don't know about you, but I, I wanna, when I always read these stories, I go, I don't want to be the third guy. Uh, so what is it that the master found praiseworthy about the first two, and what is it the master didn't find praiseworthy about the third? I, I got to know, right? So one thing we might do, and this would be very easy for us, is to look at it through sort of a capitalistic type of lens. And, and I want to say to you, I'm, I'm not opposed to capitalism. Nobody needs to send me any emails about that. Um, but we have a tendency to think that bigger is better and that bling is king, right? Isn't, isn't that kind of how we look at things? We think the rich have worked hard and they've earned what they have and that the poor, they're just not trying hard enough. Um, and so it would be so easy to read this, this parable through that lens, right? Well, these two guys were good because they made more, and this other guy wasn't because he, he didn't. But let me ask you again, does that sound like the gospel to you? Is that how God and God's kingdom work? So are you familiar with the story of the widow's might? It's a, it's a famous little story of Jesus's in Luke 21. I'm going to read it to you. It's a few verses. Jesus was in the temple. He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he says to his disciples, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. So you get the picture, you got some rich people who are putting in a whole bunch of money, and you have a poor widow who puts in this tiny little bit, and uh, who does Jesus praise in the story? The one who put in just the, the little bit, right? And so if you, if you know the scriptures, if you, if you, if you uh, know kind of the, the, the God that is expressed in the scriptures, you know that uh, we say that people look at outward appearances. What does God look at? The heart. God wants to know what's going on inside. So again, I would suggest to you that this, this parable really can't be about the amount that they produce. I don't think that's what about. Okay, so maybe it has something to do with the servants, what, their hearts maybe? Uh, so verse 29 in this scripture says something to me that is very uncharacteristic of Jesus. By the way, any of you when you heard this parable being read or maybe when you read it in, in, the, in your bulletin this morning, did, you, did anything kind of make your antennas go up and go, that just doesn't sound right? Anybody? Uh, I would suggest to you that when you have those moments, pay attention to them, right? Some, something's not right here. So verse 29 says this. It's very uncharacteristic of Jesus. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Does that sound very Jesus-y to you? Does it sound compassionate and kind and loving to you? I would say to you this is really the, quite the opposite of what the New Testament teaches in many places. Typically, the New Testament says things like this. The rich will go away empty, and it's the hungry that are going to go away filled. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. That's, that's more like the, the gospel. So again, that ought to catch our attention, and it ought to make us ask, what's going on? Here's the truth. If, if you read that, he, Jesus says, those who have nothing will go away with, with uh, even what they have will be taken away. So who in this parable has nothing? And the answer is, no one. In fact, all of these servants have been given an abundance, okay? So uh, part of the problem with reading this parable is it's our uh, English word, talents. So when you hear that these people were given talents, what do you think of? You think, like, I can sing, and I can dance, and I can do, like, they have, how do they use their talents, right? Uh, the truth is, a talent is a sum of money in the Roman world. It was the largest measurement of money that was known at the time. So listen to this. This is where my math and accounting people kick in with me. So uh, a talent was equal to 6,000 denarii. Now, a denarius is a standard Roman coin that had the value of one day's labor. So a talent is 6,000 of these things. So a talent is how many days labor? 6,000, okay? Now, 
math people again, 6,000 days. Anybody got an idea how many years? You know, there really are people who can like do that. I had to get my calculator out. So 6,000 days is around 16 and a half years. So let's call it 16 years, okay? So let's assume somebody makes $50,000 a year. Again, math folks, how, many, how much money are we talking about here? $50,000, 16 years, $800,000. I heard somebody say it over here, <laughs> $800,000. So uh, there were times when reading this parable that I would feel badly for the guy who only got one talent. This week, when I really kind of did the math, I realized that feeling badly for him is like feeling badly for Jimbo Fisher getting fired. <laughs> the guy got $800,000 given to him. So who in this parable has nothing? Now, what would make somebody with such a fortune live as if they had nothing? Uh, I thought to myself, maybe he was comparing himself to the others. Maybe he said, hey, I only got one. That guy got two. And that guy got five. And it made him feel like what? I don't have enough. Uh, One of my favorite quotes, I say it to my children pretty regularly. It's also good for me to hear. Comparison is the thief of joy. You all ever hear that? It's a really important thing. Comparison. Comparing ourselves to other people. Why did this guy feel like he had nothing? Why did he live as if he had nothing? Maybe he was comparing himself to others. Or perhaps he just had a scarcity mindset. The master had entrusted him with an incredible blessing. Maybe he just couldn't see it. And this is something for us to consider, especially as we head into the week of Thanksgiving. Are we grateful for what we've been given? Do we live as if we have an abundance, or do we live as if we have nothing? Uh, Not just about stuff, by the way. I was thinking to myself, like, what is the greatest gift that God has given me? I'd ask you to think about that. And, of course, I think about, the, the, my, you know, my family, my, my wife, Tasha. Uh, you know, I think, think about all those things. But I dug a little deeper and thought, you know, what's the greatest gift? And I know we're in church. You're all going to go, Jesus, that's what he's looking for. It's really not. What I was thinking is, <laughs> it's my life. It's my life is the great, this, this beautiful thing that I get to be a part of. It can be difficult. It can be painful. But it's beautiful, isn't it? It's wonderful. It's this tremendous gift we've been given. Uh, Mary Oliver, Mary Oliver, who is one of my favorite poets, and I realized she's like the, really the only poet I like. So Mary Oliver, my favorite poet, says this, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Right. So anyway, could that be what Jesus is looking for in these servants? Is it that some of them had an, you know, kind of an attitude of abundance and some of them had an attitude of, the one had an attitude of scarcity and that was, but, but here's the thing, I, I think that's worth pursuing, but it still makes it ultimately about whether they get something right or wrong. And it still, still makes it about what they're, where they're producing. Uh, and so I still want to caution us about that and I want us to dig a little deeper. So here's the thing that really caught my attention in this parable and I think this is the key. It's how the servant with the one talent viewed the master. How the servant with the one talent viewed the master. I don't know if you caught it. There were a lot of words in there, you know, but, but the servant with the one talent saw the master as harsh, as someone who takes what is not his. And in verse 25, he says the reason that he hid the talent was because he was afraid of the master. Now, what we've seen from the master in this story is that he's not harsh. Let's leave the end alone for a minute. We'll get there. What we've seen from the master is that he's generous. He gives these incredible blessings to these servants. One of the things I thought was amazing was that he gives them these blessings, then he goes away. What does he do? He trusts them. He trusts that they're, they're going to do something with this. Uh, and at the end, he's even willing to share his joy with his workers and his servants. So it really makes me wonder. I got the master that I see in the parable, and I got the master the way that the guy with the one talent sees him. And I wonder, did the third servant really know the master? Go with me again. The master gave him great gifts, but he's not grateful. The master trusted him, but he doesn't trust the master in return. I think he completely missed the master's love and grace. And that is what informed 
the way he lived his life. He lived his life small. He lived it afraid. He lived it afraid to take risks. But the successful servants, I think they knew the master. I think they got it, right? They knew that the master was generous. They knew that the master loved them and trusted them. And and so they loved and they trusted the master in return. And in the same way, that understanding of the master informed the way that they lived their lives. They lived full lives, unafraid lives. They were willing to take risks. You get the contrast? If that's true, then this parable is not about the amount the servants produced. It's not about their attitudes. It's about their relationship with and their trust in the master. You with me? So then this is the deal. What they did with their talents was a byproduct of their trust in the master, not the other way around. You get what I'm saying? So we have a tendency to read the parable and go, hey, this is what they did, and here's how they ended up with the master. I would suggest to you that where they were with the master (laughs) informed what they did. Y'all with me? You can chew on this a little bit. So John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, asked some really important questions. When somebody would come and they'd say, hey, I want to be a Methodist preacher, there were some primary questions that he would ask. The very first one, and Wesley was a smart guy, and he knew a God of love and grace. So the first question he asked is this, do they know God as a pardoning God? Do they know God as a God of mercy? Do they know God as a God of love? And the second question he asked was this, and have they the love of God abiding in them? And these were the things that Wesley was looking for in his preachers because I think he knew if they knew God as a merciful God and they had the love of God abiding in them, it would inform inform everything else that they did, right? Similarly, I think he knew that if they did not know God as a merciful God and if they did not have the love of God abiding in them, it would what? Inform everything else that they did. See, when we are secure in God's love and grace, when we really are secure in that, we can live life in a new way. When we're secure in God's love and grace, we become more loving and grace-filled ourselves. We become more generous, more merciful, more kind. Uh, We're also willing to take more risks in life, uh, which I think is a key behavior that we see from the first two servants. Uh, They knew that the master was good and loving, and so they weren't afraid to live. Life is risky, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, I read a quote this week. This is a funny one. People have had a hard time getting this. It's funny, so I'm telling you ahead of time. You're supposed to laugh. (laughs) Courage is knowing it might hurt and doing it anyway. Wait. Stupidity is the same. That's why life is hard. When we are secure in the love and grace of God, uh, we aren't afraid to live. And living is risky, right? Loving is risky. I'm sure most of you have had the experience of opening your heart to someone at some point in time in your life and having them break your heart, right? Loving and letting somebody love you is risky. I hope if that's ever happened to you that you've risked love again. Right? Because otherwise, you're not what? You're not alive. Right? So, living is risky. Uh, when we are secure in our, the love and grace of God, I think even more importantly for us as Christians, uh, we are willing to take risks that produce fruit for God's kingdom. Let me give you some examples. When we're secure in God's love, we can risk loving people. And I don't just mean in kind of a romantic relationship kind of way. Uh, Jesus calls us to love people, and not just people who are easy to love, not just people who are just like us, uh, people that it might be challenging to love. Jesus even says love our enemies. Talk about a risk. When we're secure in God's love, uh, we will risk extending grace to others because we've experienced that grace ourselves, right? And I think, man, you know, I've messed some stuff up in my life, but God is still my God and God still loves me. What if I extend that same grace to somebody else? That's risky. When we're secure in God's love, we risk caring about the world. One thing I realized this week, you know, when we care, you know what comes along with care? Responsibility. So those of you who have children, if you care about your child and your child runs into the street, you just sit and do nothing? 
What do you do? You take responsibility and you run out. So if I say I care about the world, if I say I care about what's going on, I care about what's going on in my community, I care about people who are hurting and people who are poor and people who are oppressed, and I dare to actually care about that, guess what? It's going to cost me something. There's risk. When we're secure in God's love, though, we're willing to risk our comfort and our security for others. Uh, So some of you will be familiar with the name Clarence Jordan and Koinonia Farm. Uh, Clarence Jordan was a a preacher who started this experiment in rural Georgia in the 1940s. Uh, And the experiment was a community of uh, poor blacks and poor whites living together and trying to to make it uh, by, by running a farm. As you might imagine, in 1940s rural Georgia, this was not very popular. Uh, the community tried everything they could to shut down Koinonia Farm. So it was a working farm, right? So they were selling produce. The community said, we're not buying from them. When their workers would go downtown with their trucks to pick up supplies, the, the townspeople would slash their tires. And at one point in time, in 1954, the KKK had had enough. They went out to Koinonia Farms one night, and they burned down every building on the farm except for the house of uh, Reverend Jordan. They had some standards. The day after that fire and destruction, a newspaper reporter went out to the farm to see what remained, and amidst the smoldering rubble, he found the house of of Dr. Reverend Dr. Clarence Jordan still standing there, and he went up to the door. He wasn't home, and he went out in the backyard, and he was out working in the garden. So the reporter went up to him and said, well... You got two PhDs, and you've put 14 years into this farm, and now you got nothing to show for it. Just how successful do you think you've been? And Reverend Jordan stopped hoeing, and he turned to the reporter, and he said this, Sir, I don't think you understand us Christians. What we are about is not success. What we are about is love and faithfulness. In order to be loving and faithful, we must be willing to take risks for the one who loved us so much that he marched into the very jaws of hell for us. When we're secure in the love and grace of God, we can take risks for others. So I entitled the sermon, The Greatest Risk of All. Uh, you got any idea what you think it might be? The greatest risk of all. Uh, Here's what I think it is based on this parable. I'd say the greatest risk of all is not knowing and trusting the God of love and grace. The greatest risk. I also think that's the secret to living a full and an abundant life, by the way, knowing and trusting that God that Jesus reveals to us. So let me ask you this. Do you know God as a pardoning God? Do you have the love of God abiding in you? If so, what risks are you taking? Who are you risking to love? What are you risking to care about? What kingdom of God things are you sticking your neck out for? And by the way, if you're still working out this God of love and grace thing, there's a fantastic book I would recommend called The Good and Beautiful God. It is at our resource table. It's free. Pick up. Take it with you. Read it if you like it. Well, I would say if you like it. Keep it if if it's really meaningful to you. If not, bring it back and someone else can can share it. So in closing, I told you I'd get to the part about the into the joy and outer darkness stuff. But real quick. So What the servants in this parable did with their talents was a byproduct of their relationship with the master, not the other way around. You with me? The servant with one talent didn't know the master. He didn't know the master as a a master of grace and love and generosity and kindness, and his life showed it. The master did not need to throw that servant into outer darkness. He was already living there. But the servants, the first two, who did know the master, they did know his grace, his mercy. They knew he was generous and kind. They lived like their lives showed it, and they risked for others, and they multiplied their lives, and they multiplied God's love. 
when the master invited him into his joy, uh, he was simply affirming what was already true in their lives. You got me? So my prayer for us is this. May we trust in the love and the grace of God. May our lives show it. Uh, that when the master returns, he will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.